You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have uh, Dr. Howie Hinden. Uh, he's a dentist. We graduated from New York University College of Dentistry. He's trained in general dentistry, but also an emphasis on surgery and endodontia. He's also uh, worked in the area of cosmetic dentistry, temporal mandibular joint disorders, TMJ, and cranial facial pain. So, uh, Howie, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing well today. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm excited about doing this podcast with you. Oh, good. And I know you're not just a traditional dentist. Where have you gone with your uh, with your knowledge base, and what what areas of dentistry have you settled in that are not your typical? Okay, so my journey has take, taken me uh, to a lot of different places, but where I am now in my life after 53 years of being a dentist, uh, I said I'm still in practice. But I run two organizations. One is the American Academy of Physiological Medicine and Dentistry, APMD. And I'm also the founder and director of the Foundation for Airway Health. And um, that's my interest and passion. Uh, And that's what I would love to be able to talk about today. It sounds like, uh, I don't know, it sounds like it'd be a simple thing. How could there need to be a foundation for airway health? What's involved in it? Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little story of how we got started. About 10 years ago, uh, one of my friends, Dr. Mike, Michael Gelb, uh, his father was actually one of the pioneers in TMJ. We were talking about we should never have to see the patients we see. We do a lot of TMJ, sleep and airway problems. And uh, so we decided to, let's start a, let's start an organization. Let's start a foundation. Uh, let's write a book about it. We wrote a book called GASP, which is a, a, a book about the hidden airway problems. And um, so we started the AAPMD. And the AAPMD was uh, meant to be an organization centered around airway. And we said, Airway is really is more than sleep because if somebody's not breathing well at night and it's affecting their sleep, they are they are also not breathing well during the day. And we wanted it to be an inclusive organization that any practitioner who had anything to do with airway, be it a physician, dentist, physical therapist, speech language pathologist, nutritionist, could all have an equal seat at the table. And that was about that was uh, about nine years ago. Uh, fast forward to where we are today, we've created the, our conference around a theme called Collaboration Cures, meaning that we think that the health problems of today can best be solved by collaborative care. So if I told you that we have an epidemic of, a growing epidemic of chronic disease, uh, poor performance, growth and development problems, and uh, learning issues, you probably wouldn't be shocked about, especially in the United States, where we're number one in healthcare expenditures and about 14th in the world as far as the health of our population. That wouldn't be surprising. The thing that you might not be aware of is they now believe that a lot of these chronic diseases can be uh, prevented and even reversed, but not by any one pill or treatment or medication, but by a collaborative approach, focusing on more personalized medicine. So 
if you think about cardiovascular disease, there's work done by a cardiologist, Brad Bell, and others who now have a way to reverse cardiovascular disease. Uh, also, a researcher, a physician, um, Brad um, Del Bredesen from California, wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's, and he has now reversed mm. Alzheimer's in over 500 uh, patients. Not by well, any. Before we, one, yeah, yeah, before, before we move on, it makes total sense to have a team of medical people with different specializations helping you when you're sick. But uh, this sounds like it's beyond that. So what, you know, how uh, how did Dale Bredesen reverse Alzheimer's in people, you know, to your understanding? And how did uh, the other doctor you mentioned reverse cardiovascular issues? Like, what are some specifics? Okay, so um, let's talk about Alzheimer's. So what uh, Dr. Bredesen, uh, his belief is, and he calls it 36 holes in the roof. He's identified 36 reversible causes of Alzheimer's, including nutrition, um, toxic materials, hormonal imbalances, uh, poor um, relationships, Every, everything affects the brain. And his belief is Alzheimer's may not really be a disease. It's that our brains get overwhelmed by the load of, of our lifestyle. And they say, look, our brains say, I can't deal with all the stuff that, are, that I have to deal with. I have to keep breathing. I have to keep my heart beating. I have to make sure I keep my temperature regulated. I can't do everything. I'll dump some memory. And, and uh, it may be that the, the uh, plaque that forms in the, in the brain of Alzheimer's may be an attempt to put a bandage on, on a wound, just like the plaque in arteries is, is, is like a bandage. So the important thing for dentistry is there are several issues where the dentist plays a key role. The uh, certain bacteria in the mouth called uh, P. gingivalis is a, is a bacteria that's very common in periodontal disease. And it's the same bacteria that's found in the atherosclerotic plaques of people who have um, cardiovascular disease and the same bacteria that's found in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. Oh, wow. And, and, and uh, so, and there's only one place it could come from. It's, it's, it's from the mouth. And so the belief is that if you have that bacteria and there's not a good barrier that keeps it in the mouth, like inflamed gums where the, the, the barrier breaks down and there's pocket formation, that bar barrier can get into the bloodstream. If you couple that with a sleep airway problem and it's, it's completely accepted that if you have a sleep problem, then you have a greater level of inflammation. So now the same amount of bacteria that may not cause as much of a problem in somebody who, who doesn't have a sleep problem is going to have much more of, a, of an effect because anybody who has a sleep problem is going to have an altered immune system. Uh, by the same token, mm -hmm. if you have uh, different materials in your mouth, like, like mercury or nickel or other materials, you add another burden. And that's only, we're only talking about the dental arena. Now, if you had nutritional well, prob problems or with, with uh, sugar and other things, you could see how the, the, the total load begins to build up. That makes sense. If, if, if you don't mind, can we focus on the dental arena? Because that's not a lot of people have knowledge about those specifics. And, you know, I'm sure Absolutely. you do. Absolutely. So, so the, the questions that came to mind, you know, if I have a filling mercury filling from 20 years ago, you know, is that still uh, leaching mercury into me or is it fine? What's your experience and opinion? So uh, quite the answer is it may or may not be because uh, a filling that's put in at some point in time will leak, but the amount of mercury that leaks out will be slower over a period of time. However, there are other factors. If your mouth tends to be more acid, it will leak more. If you have other materials in your mouth, then there will be the uh, battery-like effect. So, for example, you have a mouthful of mercury fillings or a few mercury fillings, and then something breaks down and you have a, a crown put in that's a different metal, and your mouth is acid. Now you'll have a battery-like effect between the 
the two different metals, and the mercury will actually leak out at, at a faster rate. Oh, huh. that's really interesting. So now, any now other, the, uh, what, what other metals are they using now for crowns and the uh, fillings and stuff? You know, what is the most modern things they use? Well, you know, being being an old, older person, I remember the days where it was just uh, uh, silver and gold were the choices. Now, um, a, a lot of dentistry and in our practice, we only use uh, zirconium or, or ceramics. So we don't use any metal in the mouth. We don't want to we don't want to put any metal in, in, in people's mouths. Um, and uh, being aware of the different ways that that metals uh, affect each other, you know, when when the price of gold began to really go up years ago, dentists started using more of uh, nickel, and, and nickel is is a very toxic metal. Um, it's good for dentistry; it's easy to work with. It, it's, it gives you a durable result, but it's not a really biocompatible material. And if you put nickel and right. mercury in the same mouth. That's really not a good situation, you know. Then uh, the, way, the way this collaboration works is if you also have certain certain genetic uh, alterations. There's something called the APOE4 gene. That if you have a certain variation of that gene, you're going to be a, a poor detoxifier. Or if you don't sleep well, huh. you'll be a poor poor detoxifier. So. You, you're going along, and all of a sudden something breaks. You or you, or you're grinding your teeth because you're not sleeping well. You break a tooth. You get a a different type of metal in your mouth. All of a sudden you have a, a more mercury put, leaking out, and you have a sleep problem, and you have a, a genetic alteration. That's why we always have to get back to the, the collaborative effort, and you have to be able to think. Even though I'm a dentist and I focus in the dental arena. Uh, I need to think about what else is going on and who else needs to be a partner for this particular patient uh, in order to get optimal care. Yeah, no, that makes sense. There's a whole big conversation on, you know, why medical people either collaborate or don't collaborate and how people are siloed into their specialties. And, you know, we won't really get into that because it's a whole, again, endless conversation. But um, we th- you talked earlier about airway health. What What's involved in airway health? How can people breathe right or breathe wrong? What what can happen with the airway to cause them problems? Okay, so the you know the whole field of airway sleep medicine and obstructive uh, sleep apnea is probably somewhere between 75, 50 and seventy five years old. So it's a relatively new branch of of uh, medicine and 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 dentistry because dentists play a, a role in that. And uh, the disease is called obstructive sleep apnea. And the concerns are uh, what can happen, and you can be tested for it. You can go into either have a home test or, or have a test in a lab, and they measure the number of times you stop breathing for 10 seconds or more, which is obstructive sleep apnea. But if you are sleeping at night and your airway begins to close, and it doesn't close all the way, and then you wake up, or you don't wake up fully, you just aroused to a, a state of sleep below wakefulness, and uh, it doesn't count as an apneic, apneic episode. And if you don't have enough apneic episodes, then you don't have a diagnosis. But whether you have apnea and you stop breathing, or whether you have a what they call hypopnea and you're breathing with more resistance, or you have an arousal, the physiological effect on your body is exactly the same. So even though you may not get a diagnosis, you could have the same physiological effect. So um, if I can give you an example so, of, of what happened. Well, I think I have, I have one example. So if I'm in the stage of my sleep where I want to be in deep sleep for the next hour, but because of my breathing, I come out of deep sleep, you know, 30 times in that hour to a light sleep stage that essentially kills my deep sleep and would hurt me physiologically, right? Right, because there, that uh, you know, when I when I was a kid, I always wondered why we were going to spend a third of our life sleeping. It seems like an awful waste of time. But what we do in that third of our life will determine how good the other two thirds of our life are. So when we're asleep, we consolidate memory. The uh, our immune system repairs itself. Uh, our our body 
slows down. We get rid of waste in this whole wonderful process of cleaning up all the day's activities. It's sort of like the restaurant is dirty at the end of the day. And then in the morning, at night, the crew comes in. And the next day, everything is is open and everything is bright and clean and ready to, to start over. Uh, if you don't get the deep sleep, you may be tired during the day. And the, and the most important thing about these airway problems is you don't know it. You don't know how you're sleeping or, or not sleeping. Uh, that's why we call it uh, the unrecognized or hidden airway problems. If you are screwing up your diet, you know it. If you're not getting enough exercise, you know it. But if you're not sleeping, you have no idea how the quality of your sleep. An example that you just gave me, uh, if you're not going to deep sleep and you rise up to a state just below wakefulness, you don't know that you're doing it. All you'll know is you said, I don't feel rested. So what do you do? You have a cup of coffee in the morning and you get yourself going so you can be ready for uh, to do an exciting interview. And, and you know you don't think about it, but but day after even one night's poor sleep uh, changes your immune system, increases chronic inflammation, affects brain function. But if so, if you add days in a row, weeks in a row, months in a row, the you know we believe that the seeds of dementia and Alzheimer's are are planted 20 to 30 years before the any indication of of that disease occurs. You mentioned uh, also airway problems during the day. What, what would those be for people? So if we're talking about at night, if your airway closes and, and you don't breathe, uh, people during the day, when they relax or they don't pay attention, the same thing may happen. Uh, uh, one indication of that is people who sigh a lot. Uh, all of a sudden, the airway begins to close, and all of a sudden, you go, you take a deep breath, or you sigh. That's an indication that your that the airway is closing. Whenever that happens, you get this spurt of a adrenaline. And people who have an ongoing airway problem tend to be adrenaline addicts, meaning they they need to be in an adrenaline state. So they live their life needing an adrenaline fix. So, for example. Uh, if you're an adrenaline addict and you know you can comfortably do three things in an hour, you plan five. Uh, you, you always need to have an edge. You choose to work in a difficult job. You choose difficult relationships because the way that you keep your airway open is by getting that adrenaline fix. So the way you, you know about it is one, you sigh a lot. Uh, two, do you, are you an adrenaline addict? If I was to say to you something like, I'm going to give you a gift, a week's vacation on the most beautiful beach, and all you have to do is do nothing, lay on the beach and do nothing for a whole week. Does that make you uncomfortable or comfortable? Oh, I would hate that. But then again, I don't think I'm an adrenaline junkie, but I would hate to sit there and do nothing. Yeah, but then the people who I don't believe they are, but people say, well, can I read a book? I said, no, you can't read a book. Can I Can I jog? No. And, and so people who have that... Uh, uh, that issue don't want to do nothing. They always need to be doing something. They need to be doing several somethings at the same time. And so, you know, in Chinese medicine, they talk about yin and yang and the balance of of uh, uh, of going out and doing things and coming back and repairing. And so we have a deficit. It's like we're overspending on our health credit card. We're and, and people who are doing that are usually very successful. They usually high achievers, and then something happens, and they and they break down, and they say, "Well, I was okay yesterday, and now I'm not." It must be something that happened in the last 24 hours, but it's not. It's something that happened mm-hmm. over over a period of of years. I mean, so I mean, we could you could predict who are the people that are, that are going to have uh, are going to have problems, and uh, you know, for example, if you're not sleeping well. You, you're going to crave more caffeine. You're going to crave more sugar. That, that throws your whole cycle out. Um, when you go to sleep at night, we're supposed to turn off our daytime neurotransmitters, which are epinephrine and dopamine, and shift over to melatonin, GABA, and serotonin. It's just, 
And there's a beautiful cycle that, that goes on. Our blood sugar is higher at night than gradually falls in the morning and we get up and um, uh, and we're ready to go out and hunt to hunt and gather like our ancestors do or go to work uh but if our sleep is altered we'll get spikes in our blood sugar at night uh and people who are diabetic their blood sugar is usually the higher highest in the morning uh we see patients who will say you know i'm taking medication my diabetes is under control except for the morning when that that seems to be higher, but when their treat their sleep is treated, that can come under control. In fact, that we have seen many patients who, when when their uh, their sleep is treated, they're able to reduce or get off their their medication. So you know, so and you know, in in dentistry, if you have a sleep problem, what are the choices? Uh, a CPAP, which is a mask wear of your nose, uh, a dental appliance, which is good for mild to moderate sleep apnea, surgery, which is ra- rarely effective. And now they have a new thing where they have these implantable um, devices that uh, that you, it's almost like a, uh, a pacemaker for your tongue that keeps your tongue out of your airway. Uh, oh, the so, hypoglossal nerve stimulator, the tongue shockers. Yeah, the um, Inspire uh, medical implant, which is, uh, which is, Certainly great for uh, children who have uh, Down syndrome children, the, the people who, who would be responsive to other treatments really made a huge difference in, in that particular patient population. Well, so, you know, I've, I've spoken a lot about CPAPs and oral appliances and, you know, and even a little bit about the hypoglossal nerve stimulators, but how effective are those treatments? Um, you have to also address that like you talked about collaborative medicine, you know, the diet and the other aspects just as critical to getting a good result or to those devices, are those devices enough to, to fix people? Okay. So in, in my view, the, the, one of the big problems in medicine, if you have a problem and you do a CPAP or you do an oral appliance, you'll be better. And if you're better, the practitioner is happy, pats himself on the back. Patients is happy. I'm, I'm feeling better. But have you achieved an optimal result? You know, you know that if somebody has, uh, let's say, uh, an AHI, a sleep score of 40, and they wear an oral appliance of CPAP, and it's down, it's down to 15. So, wow, look, look how, what a great result we've got. We've, we've uh, cut it by more than half. But it's shown that you're not going to really make an impact. On the on the factors of blood pressure, uh, diabetes. Unless you get it down under five, you really get it down lower. And so, so should you stop there, or should you say, you know, I've done my role. Maybe I need to get this patient in the hands of an integrative uh, physician who can look at diet and maybe help lose some weight. Because weight loss is is another way to uh, improve sleep and, and breathing or one of the uh, one of the compensations for poor sleep and airway is a head forward position because when the, when the head is in a forward position the tongue comes forward and it opens the airway so so patients adapt this head forward position with rounded shoulders and they tend to breathe more from their upper chest and they uh, they don't use their diaphragm uh, enough and they tend to have neck pain because they're they're using the accessory muscles of the neck in order to uh, to breathe. You help them. Hey, Hallie, uh, what, Hallie, one one quick second. So, from your description, it sounds like the drive and the hunger to breathe is so great it can cause people to, in one example earlier, have drama filled lives or have you know be adrenaline junkies. And you're saying also physiologically it can cause them to change their posture and their breathing and their whole body, their whole way of doing things changes because of the hunger to breathe better. Is there anything more important? Is there any physiological need that is greater than the need to breathe? We can go without food. We can go without water. We can go without a lot of things. We only have a few minutes without air or we won't mm-hmm. survive. And uh, if somebody was to say to you, 
if I keep my head forward and I strain my neck muscles in order to breathe, I'll have pain in my neck, a chronic pain in my neck. Uh, let's see, what would I rather do, breathe or have pain? I'm, you know, there's no choice because our brain makes that choice. So uh, if, yeah, if there's it's just weird that people do that. It's just amazing that people would do that, I guess. Well, you have, you have the, you know, the story about a kid who's mad at their parents and say, I'm going to hold my breath until I die. It's impossible. You, you cannot, yeah. you, you cannot force yourself to stop, to stop breathing. Um, and so like people can go to do body work or see uh, a chiropractor and they say, I have the most wonderful chiropractor in the world. I always feel good when I leave that office, but the adjustments don't hold. Well, the adjustments may not hold because mm-hmm. there's an underlying airway issue and huh. patients and the brain says, you know, if I keep my head and my neck muscles relaxed and I, and I hold that position that the chiropractor put me in, I, I'm not breathing well. I mean, we, we see huh. that all the time with, with connections uh, uh, throughout the whole body. I mean, we, we, uh, we look at patients, uh, their gait, how they walk. Uh, are they listening to one side? Are they favoring one side? The the relationship of the of jaw position and bite is is, uh, is fascinating. Uh, I work with my son who who is doing a research project with Wild Cornell Medical Center using oral appliances treating Tourette's patients, and it's, it's the study is just about to be published and. Uh, and, and, the, and the results are excellent because if you think about it, and we believe that it's an underlying airway problem, that if I came up behind you and put my hand over your nose and mouth and didn't let you breathe, you would be screaming and, and kicking and and uh, and cursing, and, uh, right. and and we and we can measure that with something called uh, heart rate variability, which measures the, the physiology of the patient, which looks at. Uh, how we go from the uh, more sympathetic or yang state to the, the in state and people who are who tend to be who are Tourette's patients tend to be stuck in more of that adrenaline sympathetic upregulated state you know we e- even though we seem to get more done because we have more energy it's not the most efficient state to be in uh so how do you, you how do you approach fixing someone when you look at some of the airway or all the ancillary problems that can happen is the first go to, to do a sleep study and then like optimize their sleep a hundred percent or what, how do you begin to make headway with all these situations? Okay. So, uh, life is simpler where you just do a sleep study and say, okay, they, they qualify for an appliance or, or don't, but, uh, in a more looking at things from a more collaborative approach, you say, all right, what's 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 going on? Does the patient have several problems, health problems that are that that need somebody else in the picture? Because collaboration should be done at the very beginning. You you want to build a team for that that particular patient, and so that team may include a dentist, may include a physician of di- of uh, different specialties, may require a physical therapist. Uh, or a myofunctional therapist or, or or a nutritionist. So what we do in our office, we we, we do a very thorough health history. Uh, we look at their blood chemistry. We want to look at inflammatory markers to see whether or not they uh, they have have chronic inflammation. Uh, and we look at their periodontal health, which could be an indication of a uh, of inflammation and sleep problem. And then uh, I know that. Your uh, your your podcasts are, are uh, involved with tech. Uh, the the one of the one most wonderful things is these three dimensional uh, X rays called tone beam CAT scans, where we can we can actually get a measure of the of the airway looking at the uh, uh, in three dimensions. Uh, huh. Of course, of course, the what you see on the X ray, the size of the airway doesn't really tell you how much effort that person is expending in order to keep their airway open. So somebody could have a very small airway, but they're not working hard to maintain it. But somebody could have a larger airway, and then you can see on the x-ray the, the back of the tongue is all is is distorted, that they are working 
24 seven to keep their airway open. And they also have a very straight, almost like a military, they call it military neck. So the, keeping their neck straight and their tongue forward, having constant muscle tension is the way they keep their airway open. And as soon as they would re- relax, the airway begins to close. So these are people that, that their brain says relaxing isn't a healthy state to be in. So cone beam CAT scan is, is, is a great tool. And then the other thing that we do is uh, we do what we call physiological monitoring. So it's instrumentation that uh, we do an EKG respiration rate by putting these uh, belts around the chest and the, and the abdomen. So we can measure the rate that people breathe through their upper chest and through their abdomen. And we want to see whether they're breathing more. And we, and we take those, the data from that with muscle contractions, e- EMGs, and we get a printout of, of what their physiological state is. And then when we alter the jaw position, whether it's for a TMJ fry appliance or for a sleep appliance or for an athletic performance appliance, we, we, we look for changes, objective data in the physiology. That's how we determine uh, where we're going to place the jaw for optimal results. Well, let's talk briefly about TMJ. Where do you believe that the TMJ stems from? Or what are some of the places it can come from? I think that almost the vast majority of TMJ problem come from an airway problem. That that uh, I can't remember the last time I saw somebody with a TMJ problem that didn't have a underlying airway problem because uh, whenever you have an apneic event where you stop breathing and on a sleep study, a bruxism or clenching event precedes every apneic event. And and if you're having 20, 30 an hour, you're having apneic events. So we see a distortion where muscle contractions uneven the this wear on, on the condyle one jawbone greater than the other and uh and if and if this goes on for a number of years you begin to get alteration or derangements within the tmj anatomy the disc gets out of place and uh and now you have this imbalance which adds further stress to the system so uh and answer your question i think the number one cause of a tmj problem is is an airway problem uh you know, and, and so then, again, it's the uh, the airway is compromised. So the body is, you know, tightening muscles, moving things, trying everything it can to uh, restore the airway. What wouldn't you do to breathe better or to breathe oh, I, adequately? I, I understand. Anything. It's just, it's just it's just funny that again, my perception, not knowing, is like I'm walking around and breathing fine. You know, why would my body need to uh, to do all these things to improve my airway? And, you know, consequently, when I look at other people, I would think that they probably think that they're breathing okay, or I don't know. I mean, I guess it, it seems subtle, but the effect is not subtle at all. Right. That's a, So that's exactly the point that everybody, I know that when anybody comes into my office, I know they're breathing, but we don't know the effort that they're expending in breathing. So uh, you look at children. What are the signs of an airway problem in children? Uh, poor learning, uh, bedwetting, uh, increased uh, allergies. But they're breathing. You know, they have circles on their eyes. Their mouth is open. They're, they're breathing. They're putting more effort into breathing. Uh, you treat their sleep. You do some changes in their growth and development if it's early enough by by doing expansion orthodontics. And lo and behold, their their scores go up in school. Um, bedwetting stops. They were breathing before, but they were they were breathing with uh, compensations that that affected them. And so that's that's the challenge of looking for these underlying uh, problems. We have uh, I mentioned our uh, our foundation. Uh, we've created this. Uh, Global Airway Health Day, which is going to be October 2nd. Now, why do we pick October 2nd? Because October 2nd is O2, which is oxygen. Uh, and and our, our goal our goal is um, by 2020, we want to help a million people a year recognize an unrecognized airway problem. 
Uh, and uh, we now have, uh, and we think this, this uh, campaign is a partnership of the public, practitioners, corporations, and organizations. And every week we have more of each group coming on board to support th this project. We have uh, uh, on our on our foundation website, which is airwayhealth.org, we have success stories, people who lives have changed dramatically just by recognizing and treating their airway problem. Uh, and uh, we've created that as a free resource to the public and to practitioners to just go and learn more. We have a free sleep inventory where anybody can go take the inventory. It gets, it gets uh, uh, assessed by somebody and it will, and it will determine their risk factors. And once you're screened, then you can take the appropriate uh, measures to, to do something about it. Uh, okay. I think that's the most important thing of, if I have one message for this, this podcast, it's that, uh, Yes, everybody's breathing. I don't think I have a problem, but you need to look at, do you have factors that are showing that you're breathing with uh, difficulty, with compensation? Is it affecting your immune system? Do you have inflammation? Uh, is it affecting your life? Uh, because what you do about it today will affect your health 10, 20, 30 years from now. A uh, good question I haven't asked. What about asthma? People that have asthma, what kind of compensations do you see that they make? That seems like a more blatant or obvious issue with the airways. Okay, so let's say somebody has a smaller airway. A small airway means that <clears throat> it, 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 you, you breathe more rapidly because you don't take as much air in with each breath. And when you don't take a, a enough volume of air in, you don't exchange the air as well. And so uh, tend to be a mouth breather. So if you're a mouth breather and you don't exchange a full volume of air, air residue collects on the bottom of the lungs. Uh, irritants, pollutants collect on the bottom of the lung. And in addition to that, you have an upregulated nervous system, immune system, which is going to have an exaggerated immune response. And so even though asthma is a separate disease, often treating the sleep problem, if there's an underlying sleep problem, or doing something to <clears throat> increase the airway will, uh, will actually Im improve or, or eliminate uh, asthmatic problems. And that's been seen in, in, many, in, in, in many patients. I mean, you can just look at the research, sleep and asthma, a combination of how that goes together. Same is true for sleep and, al sleep and allergies. Now you have, to, you have to understand that the whole uh, <clears throat> branch of sleep medicine it's so new. It's only existed for, you know, the first CPAP was in the 90s, and that was the uh, back of a vacuum cleaner. That's how the first CPAP was created. A quick question. On a, in a sleep study, they're just looking for a certain duration of someone stopping breathing, you know, for apnea events, so maybe 10 seconds or longer, and a certain number per hour. Are they... If um, if you do a sleep study, do they just say, "Oh, you're fine, you have, you don't have apnea," or do they tell you exactly what they observed and help you look at other aspects of your sleep that may uh, may be causing you a problem, or is it just like, "Yes, no, pass, fail," you know, throw you out in the street, and you're fine. Well, you know, obviously, depending on who you go to, you the you, you could the test could be viewed as different, but but if you're looking for a diagnosis of of apnea, then it's all based on how many times you stop breathing. In, um, no, no, I don't, I don't mean, I mean, not just apnea, but do most places that do sleep studies, it's either apnea or no apnea, and that's it. or do they look at other elements of sleep? You know, in a sleep so, study, is there a lot more to learn besides apnea, no apnea? Ap there's a lot more to learn. Um, I'll give you a quick story. I have apnea. I, I've been using a... Um, oral appliance and or a CPAP combination of the two, depending upon what my needs are. I needed to get a new machine. I went for another sleep test and they said, well, in order for us to approve it, insurance to improve it, you have to do the first part of the study without anything. I said, I have not slept with any, without anything for That's 15 stupid. years. And so uh, after 
four o'clock in the morning. I said, so what's happening? They said, well, you don't qualify because we haven't counted enough of apneic episodes. I said, yeah, I haven't slept all night. Um, so I de- went down to my friend who's a sleep doctor in, in uh, Houston, Texas, put me in his lab, gave me a little sleeping pill, and they used something called the Pez. It's a, it's a little thing they slide up through your nose, down in your throat. It measures airway resistance, and it can actually oh. detect the collapse of, of the airway. And in, in uh, 30 minutes, they had enough data in order to fit me for uh, a, a new up-to-date CPAP. So uh, it all depends on, on the center and what they're looking for and how well-trained the, the person running that, that is. You know, by measuring up airway resistance, uh, if you were sucking something through a straw and I squeezed the straw, what would happen to your cheeks? They, they would sort of get sucked in. Right. Yeah, it collapses. Yeah, that's negative pressure. When we have uh, our airway collapses, one of the things that happens, we get that same sucked in um, thing happening to our chest wall, which pushes pressure against our heart, and that slows or may even stop the blood flow from our heart. And then, the, when that moment passes and everything relaxes, that that blood that's been uh, stored up and pent up gets released with greater force and that's called turbulence and turbulence mm. co- causes uh, uh, bumps up against the walls of arteries and causes uh, inflammation mechanical inf- inflammation uh Ooh, it also really? co- it o- right you know if you think about if you think about water coming down a, uh, a stream or you probably you're in you're in austin texas yep yeah so you probably get like flash floods and Things like that, where it rains and 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 then the sides okay. of the yeah gets gets uh, gets eroded by the, by the water coming. So the uh, and especially where where a tube where a blood vessel divides in two, you get more more irritation in that area, and then the body says, "Look, I got to do something." And it puts a bandage over it, which is oh. tends to be uh, lipid or fat or cholesterol, but deposit that it covers over with a calcium deposit. Which is which is plaque. So just a mechanical effect of what we call upper airway resistance, where you get these these negative pressures building up with what they call intermittent hypoxia, where where you you breathe more or less, is enough to start that whole process of uh, of, of inflammation and which is a seeds of heart disease, which again can take uh, 20 or 30 years. And also the other interesting thing when that happens. And, you're, and there's pressure against the heart. The, the brain believes that there's fluid retention, and it releases a a, uh, a protein which tells the kidney to uh, get rid of fluid. And that's why people wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. So oh. when people say, like, you know, do you sleep through the night? Well, I, I I sleep. The only reason I get up, I get up two or three times to go to the bathroom. So I right. said, well, you so you get up. Let's say you get up every Three hours, two or three hours. Says, yeah. Do you go to that? Did you have to go to the bathroom as many times during the day? No. So, so what's different at night? And and when they're tr- when their sleep is treated, all of a sudden they find they get, they're getting up once or maybe not at all to go to the bathroom. Same thing. That's the same thing that happens with bedwetters in children, where uh, um, when you treat their sleep, you don't have that uh, that airway, that negative pressure, and the release of of this uh, protein, uh, which which causes it, which tells the kidneys to, to empty, our bodies are the most incredible thing. That when everything works, it's it's fantastic. The miracle yeah. is yeah. how everything works. Every millisecond, our body and our brain is monitoring everything that goes on inside our body and everything that goes on outside our body, and is making um, minute adjustments when we walk and we shift our weight from one foot to another when we when we chew or we turn our head and we lean over to get something and we don't fall over uh, our muscles are are changing instantly like uh, the way our autonomic nervous system works i'm on a plane plane lands i go to get my suitcase the moment i think about reaching up to get my suitcase 
the uh, the blood vessels that go to the muscles that I will need to do that action dilate and send more more uh, blood and oxygen to those muscles and only those muscles, mm. and it happens in a fraction of a second. And so, getting back to what you said before, well, you know, I'm breathing. You know, it's it's hard to realize it, but if you think about well, I have to make a compensation because, you know, I, I have to do things a little bit differently. So you're not efficient. I liken it to, to a, you have a car. It runs really great. It, it's fine. You go over a bump and things are a little bit out of alignment. You still get from point A to point B, but the ride isn't as smooth, but it, it doesn't matter. You're still functioning. And pretty soon you forget how good your car was when everything ran well. And because you're still, it's still functioning. Same thing happens to our bodies. The only difference is some people never had their body functioning well, and and they and they have nothing right. to compare it. To. They have nothing to compare it to, and, and and so they are the ones, and or they may be just like everybody else in their family who has the same problem. And you know what's the big deal? You know my parents didn't sleep well, and and my family all have similar problems, but you know. We are a society that's unhealthy, and we have ways that we can reverse that. But we have to look at the things that, that aren't working. Well, Howie, we're, uh, we're out of time, but this has been like a really great call. A lot of new things that I've thought about. What's the best way for people to find out more, to get in touch, or to visit one or both of the organizations that you've created or work for? So um, if you are a practitioner, you can... Uh, Go to the AAPMD, which is www.airway, uh, www.aapmd.org, www.aapmd.org. Uh, even if you're a, not a, a practitioner, there's a lot of great information on there. If you want to go to the foundation, it's airwayhealth.org, www.airwayhealth.org. Uh, and uh, because we're doing this, O2 campaign, Global Airway Health Day, we are encouraging everybody, whether they be a practitioner or, or just a member of the public, a parent, a teacher, a nurse, to become an airway advocate, learn how to recognize an airway problem. I, I think that just from our discussion, you are more aware of, of, of unrecognized airway problems and, and you can be an airway advocate. So I would encourage you to go to our website, sign up yourself and be part of our army of airway advocates to fight this epidemic. That's great. Well, Howie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're very welcome. And thank you for having me. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, Quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.